And before we go there, I think it's really important to consider the basic principles of exercise prescription. So how to create an exercise program and really how to optimize your time spent on the EverFit platform okay? and how to create a really solid, effective program to improve your client's lifestyle, strength, performance, whatever that might be. Okay? So we have the Fit VP principle. Uh, this comes from the ACSM guidelines. But basically, you have some really, really basic and simple principles that underlie how programs can be modified and how they can be created. So you have the frequency, i.e. how often does someone train? You have the intensity. This can be how hard. This can also be considered the load. Um, you have time, duration, or how long they're training. Type, the mode or what type. So um, type could be elliptical, bike, uh, treadmill, or it could also be resistance training, plyometric training, and so on. You have total volume, which is the total amount. So total volume can be quantified by a really common way to do it is just total pounds moved in a session, aka sets times uh, reps times the weight, right? So you can basically take that approach and quantify total volume. Other ways to quantify total volume might include ground contact times and something like plyometrics. And so this is really um, giving a value to the total volume associated with the training session. And then progression. So how are you planning to progress your clients from a week to week, month to month, uh, microcycle to microcycle level? How are you progressing your client from where they are today towards their goal, whatever that might be from six months, a year from now, whenever it is, what is your game plan and approach to progressing that athlete or individual to reach that specific performance level? And more specifically, we're going to go um, take it back. Sorry, that slide's a little out of place. Um, we'll go into the principles now of the, uh, that we talked about earlier. So with this, let's first, let's dive into intensity. So how hard? Um, intensity or load. So with this, we have, if you have the, an individual's one repetition maximum, right? Um, the percent of their one RM is a good way to gauge the intensity. So this will give you a weight. So the NSCA National Strength Conditioning Association, um, these are block categories. So if you train less than 67%, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get hypertrophy and that you're not going to improve strength. However, you're going to mostly be improving endurance if you're training less than 67% of 1RM. If you're training between 67 to 85%, you're going to have a big hypertrophic adaptation. It's not to say that you're not going to improve endurance or not improve strength. Okay. And if you're training higher than 85%, you will be increasing an individual strength as well as gaining the hypertrophy, um, hypertrophic adaptation that you would be getting in the 67 to 85% range. Okay. So these are generalizations, but it's really important to know, okay, where is my individual training based on their percent one RM? Am I going to periodize them from a endurance training block to a hypertrophy block to a strength block, right? How do you want to load this individual? How do you want to progress through loading the individual through their intensity? Other ways to measure intensity would be an RPE. Um, so I like an EverFit RPE. You'll find RPE is present. I'll actually prescribe an uh, exercise um, for an individual. Let's say bench press. So set one is going to be a six out of 10 RPE. Set two is going to be a seven out of 10. Set three is going to be an eight. Set four is going to be a nine. So let's say they have four sets of five, right? On that last rep, I want them to be at a six, seven, eight, and nine out of 10. So the good thing about that is this is a solid way to auto-regulate program design and help your athlete feel, start to feel where their predicted percentages, 60%, 70%, 80%, 90% might be, right? Based on that, that load and intensity. So another way to uh, track intensity is through the RPE. Um, and then for endurance program prescription, or just for conditioning cardio type loads, heart rate is a really, really good way to measure intensity and more specifically heart rate zones. Okay. And we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. The other thing we talked about is total volume. Okay. So total volume is the amount. So total volume, uh, some very, variables measured that, excuse me, some variables that are used to measure volume. You have your sets and reps. Okay. So you can multiply the sets, how many sets this individual did times how many reps that they did, right? Combine that with their total weight. Okay. 
then you'll know their total pounds or kilograms in that training session specifically. You can also quantify total volume by time. So this is really important to track for stress and strain, progression, as well as periodization. All right. So when considering aerobic program design, some of the other uh, variables that are included in the EverFit platform, you have time. So you're going to have this individual run for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, hour, two hours, whatever it might be. You have the speed. So you, if they're using a treadmill, this is a really good way to... Um, prescribe someone to train at a specific speed or pace. Cadence, so cadence is how many steps an individual is taking per minute, right? And then you have the distance if they're doing long distance training or short distance training, AKA are they gonna be doing repeated sprints or repeated 200 meter workouts, or you're gonna have them do a long, slow training style session. All right. Another variable that's really, really important to consider that can really change the scope of a workout session is rest time. So rest time, I think is something that a lot of coaches practitioners aren't measuring as much as they possibly should. Um, and more specifically, it's really important to measure rest time because rest, right? The longer that you have to rest, the more ATP that the body will be able to regenerate and utilize in that next set. Okay. So with that, Yes, that can be important if you want to improve someone's overall quality. For example, if you really want to improve someone's vertical jump, you probably should not have them doing really, really short rest type loads uh, or short rest intervals with high load because they're not going to be able to jump as high as they possibly can by the time that they're redoing that next exercise or that next set. So you want to have a long a long work to rest ratio there to allow them to fully perform. Whereas in, if you want to apply a bioenergetic stress, right? If you want to get somebody really conditioned and improve their average power output or average force output or average movement quality, right? Then having a shorter rest time will be good because this will have more of a bioenergetic demand. So this all goes back to the needs analysis. What is the work to rest ratio of this individual? What are their needs? Are they really, really fit within the phosphagen system, but they have really, really poor cardio. Do they need better cardio? Are they still subpar with the phosphagen system and so on? So having a really, really good needs analysis will directly translate into how you prescribe rest time. Okay? So with this, to go over this table really quickly, we have four primary energy system pathways. Okay, we have the phosphagen system, which occurs all out movements from zero to 10 seconds, proper work to rest ratio here is one to 12. So let's say you assign an individual a 10 second sprint, for example, a 10 second all out sprint. To optimize the work to rest ratio with this should be one to 12. So that 10 seconds multiply it by 12, 120 seconds, two minutes. So 10 seconds on, two minutes off, 10 seconds on, two minutes off. Sounds like a long, long rest period, right? But if you consider all out full body, uh, stimulus, AKA a 10 second sprint somewhere around hundred meters, 80 to hundred meters, right? That's going to be a lot of stimulus and they're going to actually really need that two minutes to recover. And as you transition down the columns here, you can see that we work from the phosphagen system, fast glycolytic, so glycolytic to the oxidative system. And again, the work to rest ratios kind of decrease with that, uh, load and, and intensity specifically. So phosphagen system, um, bout would be most intense oxidative system bout would be least intense. So it takes more time to recover from a phosphagen bout, right. than it would to recover from a oxidative bout if they were the same duration. However, they have different durations. Um, but all in all to make sure that you get the primary takeaway here is that based on how long you're prescribing exercises, right. There are optimal work to rest ratio zones. And this is specific to improving somebody's performance, right? Not necessarily their energetic capacity. So for example, something like Tabata, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, right? That does not fit into this work to rest ratio um, column here from the NSCA. However, what that's going to do is really stress the bioenergetic system, right? And so their bioenergetics will have a big functional adaptation from that. And that individual will become a lot more fit from that, from a bioenergetic standpoint, but maybe not from a peak power output or peak performance. Standpoint.